Good afternoon uh, and welcome uh, to our session on uh, transportation infrastructure. Uh, I'm Chris Hendrickson. Uh, I'm uh, the Hammerschlag University Professor of Engineering Emeritus at Carnegie Mellon and Director of our Traffic 21 Institute there. Uh, I'm also serving as a volunteer chair of the uh, Division Committee of the Transportation Research Board uh, at the present time. I, I'm quite pleased to moderate uh, the panel today and I'm looking forward to uh, our conversation as we go forward. Uh, we're, we wanna focus on resiliency. Uh, that's been a longstanding concern for transportation uh, infrastructure. Uh, but as climate change introduces more extreme weather and things like sea level rise, it's becoming a more and more of a, of a significant concern for transportation agencies. Uh, let me start by introducing the panelists. Uh, today I have with me Josh DeFlorio from the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey on the far right. Uh, Chris Liban from Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, and Shoshana Sachs from the University of Toronto. Um, each of our panelists will offer some opening remarks to get us started, and then we'll have a, a conversation with the audience uh, in the form of questions and answers, uh, both uh, from people here in the audience, but also online. Uh, for those turning, tuning in virtually, we encourage you to submit questions on the Slido box below the live stream at any point in this session, and we'll have the staff uh, monitor those and feed us to them uh, when we turn into a, an audience discussion. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll uh, give a little bit of time to each one of our panelists, and I have an, an opening question for you to talk about during your, your opening remarks. And I'll start with Shoshana. Um, your re research focuses on what we should build and how we should build it. How can the decision making behind those questions better align infrastructure with sustainability and resilience to climate change impacts? So one of the great advantages of where we're at right now is that we have a huge amount of understanding of how our transportation system works. We have a huge amount of understanding of its vulnerabilities and also its impacts on GHG emissions, pollution, and climate change. That's the really good news. We're operating from a space of a huge amount of knowledge. The bad news is that there's a big gap in between what that is telling us looks like a sustainable and resilient transportation system where we are now and the familiar comfortable ways of moving that we all engage with a lot. So we can think of this at many different scales, but if we think of it at the scale of sort of our day-to-day -day movement, we know that we should be both from a climate change perspective, but also from a resiliency perspective, relying as much as possible on active transit and, and public transit and minimizing as much as possible private transit, the individual automobile and all of the infrastructure that goes with it. But we live in a world that's doing the exact opposite of that. The science about this is, you know, is, is basically done, right? The, the joke now about going to transportation conferences is you hear cars are bad, big cars are worse, pollution is bad, public transit and active transit are good. And you hear that over and over again. But then the big question is, okay, well, how do we make decisions about that? How do we literally build our way into the future? How do we make peace between what we know works to give us a sustainable, resilient public transportation system and what we actually do. And so that's that's the big place where our challenge lies now. Are we willing to be brave and bold in terms of what we're gonna build, how we're going to adapt, or are we gonna hold on for too long to 1950s ways of doing transportation and have, eventually have change be forced on us? That's where I would say are our big questions um, and the underlying things that we're facing. Thank you. That, that leaves lots of things to ask questions about later on. Um, let me turn <laughs> to Chris. <laughs> um, in your work as Chief Sustainability Officer at, at LA Metro, Metro, what are challenges and opportunities with expanding the public transit system and, and highways? Yeah, before I answer that, thanks to the academies for inviting us here, to Amy uh, for inviting us here today, and for the generosity of you uh, who are here in the audience. Uh, thank you for 
selecting this session, you know, uh, versus the gaming session and the other session as well. Um, before I answer Chris's uh, question, you know, for those who don't know LA Metro, we are uh, the um, uh, second or third largest agency in the whole country. Uh, we're a uh, multimodal organization. Uh, we're the metropolitan planning organization for LA County for both public transit as well as for freight and goods movement. Uh, and then we coordinate with um, uh, the regional um, metropolitan planning organization so called Southern California Association of Governments for planning for the whole Southern California region. Uh, we operate 4,800 square miles um, uh, of, of service area. Uh, we're an $11 billion organization, about 11, 000, sorry, $9 billion organization, uh, 11,000 employees, uh, and um, uh, we're an expanding system. You know, uh, uh, as I speak to you today, uh, we have about 100 uh, $20 uh, billion, dollars, up to $140 billion dollars worth of infrastructure that we're building. Uh, and then uh, current fiscal year uh, capital program is around 20 to $25 billion. Uh, I'm starting off with the question that way uh, because um, uh, as the MPO, as well as the transit uh, uh, planner, uh, constructor, operator uh, of uh, transit systems in LA County, uh, we also work together with the highway system uh, as, as well as the transit system. So there's a, this economy of, of issues. You know, on one hand, you know, the, the, uh, a lot of people are really not a big fan of our highway infrastructure uh, you know, planning, uh, and a lot of folks are not necessarily aligned uh, with us on why we're doing that. Uh, on the other hand, we're also uh, working through, you know, uh, the expansion of our system and getting folks out of their cars, reduce vehicle miles traveled, and allow for, you know, uh, a uh, safe, reliable, uh, and clean system uh, to actually be a choice uh, for different riders uh, and, and chance riders and, and transit dependent riders in, in Los Angeles. Um, that's the second, I'm, I'm focusing on the second part relative to the question, uh, because, you know, um, we are, again, a multimodal organization. Uh, we need the highway system in order for us to have a safe and fast and reliable transportation and transit network to bring people from one place to the other. Uh, and as um, now in my role uh, uh, as the Chief Sustainability Officer for the agency, uh, we not only try to figure out what the right balance is uh, for those, uh, we also try to bring in, you know, um, uh, how do we actually build, you know, uh, those infrastructures in a safe, uh, clean, uh, green way? Uh, we're also putting in equity as a big uh, component of that. Our goal by 2028 uh, is up to 40% of our projects are in equity-focused communities. And the last part there is that, you know, we bring in technologies from all, everywhere else, green, clean technologies from everyone, everywhere else, and allow for public and private infrastructure programs to actually work together. Uh, one last point I just wanted to, to mention, uh, a little bit unique to our organization. Uh, we're also, my, my team is also um, uh, in charge and responsible for uh, producing revenues uh, for, for our agency uh, through carbon credit sales, and we will invest those back, you know, uh, into the infrastructures that we build. So a lot, a lot of stuff in there, but um, uh, just, you know, beginning of, of the conversation, um, yield to the next questions later on. Thank you. Um, Josh, uh, uh, your role on resilience and sustainability at the Port Authority covers, and let me see if I can get this right, aviation, ports, urban rail, tunnels, bridges, terminals, and other facilities. Um, what types of infrastructure have increased risks of failure and or vulnerability due to climate change, uh, specifically around how these impacts may harm our supply chains or uh, the economy? All question. Um, I was gonna say it's not a competition as to how multimodal our agencies are, but, yep. <laughs> but we do operate, to, just for context here, uh, we do operate the largest airport system in the world uh, that's JFK Airport, Newark Liberty International Airport, uh, LaGuardia Airport, the Cross Hudson uh, Tunnels and Bridges, including the George Washington Bridge, Holland Tunnel, Lincoln Tunnel, uh, a relatively 
small, at least in terms of linear miles, but large in terms of passenger ridership, urban rail system called the PATH. Of course, you can't have a port authority without the port. And for the last few months, we've been the largest by 20-foot um, equivalent units in the country, just a notch above Port of LA. Uh, and then we operate a, a real estate portfolio as well that usually has some sort of transportation nexus, including the World Trade Center site. So when I'm talking about what's at stake for our organization and our role in the region, hopefully that contextualizes it for you. Um, I also, I guess, before I go further with that question, want to thank the academies. I also want to say, you don't always have to invite us together. Um, <laughs> I do like to appear on stage with Mr. Liban, yeah. uh, fellow author of, uh, well, actually the lead off author of the transportation chapter of the fifth National Climate Assessment. Check it out. Um, so it's an honor to share the stage with you again. And uh, Shoshana and Chris, uh, great to meet you for the first time. To answer your question succinctly, the answer is all of it. It's all vulnerable. And, um, but to answer it more specifically, uh, the Port Authority embarked about three years ago on a agency-wide climate risk assessment, which is a proactive engineering grade, uh, multi-stressor, how many more adjectives can I lump in there, uh, analysis to look at a very granular sense at how assets at our facilities contribute to systems and networks of systems, and ultimately how those systems carry out and accomplish the essential functions of our facilities, whether that's an airport or a port or something else. So I can answer this question with more specificity than I could uh, just three years ago. Um, and the answer, the overriding answer tends to be, uh, for us at least, based on the nature of our operations, electrical distribution infrastructure. Uh, we are so ridiculously dependent on the integrity of the grid and also the distribution uh, service within within the gates within our facility boundaries, and this has opened. This was maybe an intuitive response, but I think understanding really how important substations, transformers, feeders, and other electrical equipment is, and how um, dependent we are for operations. Of course, everything that is life safety related is backed up uh, through generators many of them fossil fuel fired, which is uh, another ball of wax. Um, but the operations generally aren't. And you can't land an airplane at night if you don't have airfield lighting. Uh, you can't operate uh, a major port facility if your container cranes won't run. And most of them now have been electrified, thankfully. And we recognize, too, that as we seek, our agency, like many agencies, has a net zero goal, uh, which is scopes <laughs> one, two, and three by 2050. And electrification is a big part of achieving that net zero goal. So we recognize that we are very dependent on electrical distribution and we will become more dependent in the future. This runs the risk of exacerbating an existing vulnerability. So we have spent a lot of time not just thinking about physical vulnerability, but about the vulnerability of our grid and of our distribution system uh, within particularly our port and airport facilities working with our utility partners, but also working to ensure that we've done everything possible to bolster the resilience of our internal distribution infrastructure. That's, that's really perceptive, Josh. Uh, it really illustrates how that we're in a system of systems and one infrastructure system like power grid influences the performance of in transportation infrastructure and other uh, infrastructure. So it's absolutely true. Um, now, now we'll turn. I have a few questions, so I'll take the privilege as moderator to, to pose a few. Uh, you and the audience should think about uh, following up. I, I won't take up our entire time with a few questions, and then we can move to the audience and then to the people in the virtual world. Um, and I'll start. Uh, Chris, maybe I'll direct a question sure. to you. Yeah. Um, how are design standards and codes changing for new projects to factor in climate change risk, and are they changing quickly enough? Short answer is not quickly enough. Um, you know, but l let me add to what Josh was saying about this first, um, in terms of vulnerability, uh, and then, because uh, it's related to the question, Chris. Um, um, you know, in, in many parts of the country, in many, many parts of the world, you know, there's a lot of talk about electrification. Maybe we could learn from the Port Authority in terms of, um, you know, how vulnerable our system could be. Right now, if there's a 
massive blackout in Los Angeles, you know, because my trains are operating on, on rail and my buses are operating on renewable natural gas. The bus comes in as a savior for the day. That they, you know, the bus can now bring people to where they need to go safely. Uh, and then the train can be pulled or towed to, to the nearest station. In electrified world, you know, um, that's a vulnerability because now if I have electric buses and I have electric trains, in the case of a massive blackout, who saves the day, right? Uh, and it's, it's conversations that folks that, that, that don't necessarily talk about uh, in terms of a homogenous fuel. And the question really is, what are we really thinking about in terms of a, an, an, a, an endpoint, right? Is it clean air? Is it electrification? Uh, is it something else or something in between? So I just wanted to, to, to lead, the, answer the question that way. Uh, in terms of standards, you know, um, I mentioned earlier that uh, we have a 140 billion, 120, 140 billion dollar capital program. And, you know, uh, I, I see this in, in several different ways. So the first one is we have our design standards, design criteria uh, that uh, is based on empirical information from when climate change was actually, the data was actually available. So, and, and so that's one part of it. The other part of it is uh, our engineers who are licensed, uh, who are snapping those drawings, you know, uh, they're essentially, uh, they know how the performance of these infrastructure that they're designing based on those standards, uh, but they don't necessarily and cannot necessarily predict nor are comfortable in designing something that's based just on empirical data, but it's not necessarily part of a standard itself yet. And the third part of that is the financing part, right? Uh, and in the financing part, there's a lot of uh, alternative forms of financing uh, right now. You know, uh, if you're a developer, uh, you may uh, want to consider, you know, uh, the best return investment, you know, uh, and um, if uh, an LA Metro, for example, says, hey, Mr. Developer, you know, um, we would love to and like you to consider these standards that were, uh, that, that were, that we think would, you know, reduce the impact, uh, carbon impact of the infrastructure, uh, create more sustainable infrastructure, a more resilient infrastructure. You as the private developer might say, well, I'm not really sure about that. Uh, and I'm not sure about the return on investment on, the, on those. The third part there and the fourth part there is really, you know, the conversations with the stakeholders. What are the stakeholders actually demanding, right? And how are they now influencing, including policymakers, are they influencing all these design standards? Um, over the course of the last few years, you know, there's a lot of movement on, on these. Uh, in California, we have the California Climate Safe Infrastructure Working Group, you know, was part of that under Governor Brown. And then under ASCE, American Science Civil Engineers, you know, uh, we have developed this standard called ASCE 23-73. It's called Sustainable Infrastructure Standards. Uh, for those who are interested, you could uh, you know, look for that document. And then obviously there are the um, rating systems, you know, uh, Envision, uh, as well as LEED, uh, and there are other uh, types of rating systems uh, around the world. Um, are they coming in fast enough? You know, uh, it really depends. You know, if, uh, if an agency like myself or the Port Authority, you know, uh, says, hey, you know, I demand that what you're building for me needs to be LEED certified, or Envision certified, or we say you, in my, our particular case, you have to create a sustainability plan prior to initiating the project, and you have to follow that plan, and we monitor them following the plan, then it's there, right? But if you depend on you know, the contractor and saying, hey, Mr. Contractor, what, can you do this for me? And they, and they actually look at, you know, those four factors that, consider those four factors that I mentioned earlier. Maybe they will, maybe they can. And I'll tell you this much, under a huge change order. And I stopped there for a second because that's my reality. That was my reality 15 years ago when we started this process. And that's my reality right now. That, you know, absent a standard, absent ASC 23-73, or something like that built into the tender, built into the contract, it's going to be a change order at some point 
to build in some of the things that we're talking about here in the summit and some of the things that we're thinking about in terms of a sustainable and resilient infrastructure. One thing I'd like to add to that, I think it's really important to remember, is we have here two people leading cutting edge cities. Um, and most of North America, most of the US is not in New York or LA. And most of the infrastructure we build is roads. That's the thing we build the most. We build roads, we build totally generic um, multi-lane roads that are not thinking about resilience or sustainability in any meaningful way. And that's the thing that we build the most often. And so um, you know, it's amazing to see the things being done in New York and in LA. Um, and you know, we've been running into each other sustainability conferences for more than a decade now. Yep. Uh, and it's, that stuff is really exciting. But a fundamental question is how do we get it outside of New York and LA to um, you know, the subdivisions being built within driving distance with wide roads and not much else, and to the miles and miles of highways across the United States that need to be maintained. And I don't mean like the big, sexy highways, just the everyday backcountry roads. Um, this is where we spend the vast majority of our transportation dollars, our transportation time, and we need to make those better as, as default. We need to raise the floor as well as the ceiling. Well, let me follow up on that uh, with a, a, a variant, and that is to ask about the, the time requirement for building those projects you were just talking about. Uh, uh, an example that is right facing us right now is the replacement for the key bridge that collapsed. Uh, and the expectation is it'll be four or five years before a replacement bridge is in place, and we're, we're we society is bearing the cost of all the diversion of traffic from that collapsed bridge. Um, how do we reconcile the amount of time needed to build new projects with the need to move quickly on climate change? I, if I can offer, you want to start? Oh, yeah, please, yeah. <laughs> yeah, come up and listen. But th there's a range of things we can do between short term and long term. And one of the things I like to do whenever I'm giving government advice on what to do about the transportation infrastructure is to make a bucket, right? Things you can do in a year, things that are going to take you four to five years, sort of a whole political cycle, and things that are in the decade plus. And I want people to be doing some things from each bucket all at the same time. If we only do the decade plus things, then there's a lot of costs being borne, a lot of frustration, but also so much political change that nothing ever happens. You're just always restarting the decade plus projects. So we also need to be doing a lot of the things that we can do in one year. So if we're talking about the realities of things we can do in one year for climate change, we're mostly talking about bus lanes and bike lanes. Those are the things that can be done. They can be done with paint, it's not just paint, but they can be done with paint, and you can do a lot of that within the scale of a year. You can do it at a regional level, you can do it at a local level, and you can do a lot of change if you want, and it's not that expensive. You have to buy the buses, you need to paint the roads, you need some enforcement, but you can do a lot of change at that scale. Uh, you can also do things um, for knowledge in the scale of a year, so maintenance. Uh, you know, the key bridge was a horrible, Thing to happen, but whenever a bridge falls down in North America, we hear about 15 years of reports that the bridge was in trouble. And it's not that that bridge was particularly in trouble and ignored, it was that most of our bridges have 15 years of reports saying they need a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And a non trivial percentage, like 10 to 15, 20%, depending on where you are, say a lot more than that, right? We, we built the world that we live in 70 years ago, and we built it for a 50-year timeline, and then we kind of stopped building it. And now uh, it's catching up with us. So we have to, we can't repair all of that on a one-year time, but we can, we can do infrastructure surveys at a one-year time. Um, and then we need to be laying the groundwork for doing things very differently in the future, which requires what would be a very, challenging conversation about transportation land use. Do we consider, you know, I asked someone at this conference what a good life is, and the answer was the American dream, you know, house with a good car. If that continues to be the thing we are optimizing for, we're going to really struggle to get to sustainable or resilient infrastructure. Yep. But that's a very challenging cultural conversation. Um, you know, when the current administration was elected at a federal level, I know I'm Canadians, we're watching from afar, you know, eating popcorn. 
Um, <laughs> and, and Mayor Pete became the leading transportation voice. People were wondering, is this going to be a really big change in the way the United States invests in transportation? And ultimately, that will be what is needed. But that's not on the 12-month scale. It depends, depends how much time you have. Um, following up on that, can I ask a question to Josh and Chris? Um, how are you balancing priorities and funding between repairing and maintaining existing in infrastructure um, with efforts to be proactive about changing for climate and hazards? This is, this is the hardest question you're gonna ask today uh, because there is only so much capital capacity mm -hmm. and there is no lack of unmet need, whether it's state of good repair the fundamental issue with state of good repair is conditioned efficiency effectively. Mm -hmm. And then climate resilience or, or the need to mitigate climate risk, climate related vulnerabilities is another category of unmet need. And sometimes there's a beautiful alignment between those two goals. I'd like to tell you that every project is synergistic and co-beneficial and that every state of good repair project that we consider could benefit from a sort of a climate risk lens as well we can make an investment that, that kills the proverbial two birds with one stone. And that is the case for a certain percentage of projects, but for a, another percentage of projects, perhaps a larger one, for us at least, these needs are intention. And at the very least, the argument that I have made fortunately successfully within my organization is it doesn't solve the problem to put our heads in the sand. We need to view resilience and uh, condition deficiency issues, state of good repair issues as fundamental unmet needs, and we need a process to balance and prioritize them across our capital plan so both can be reflected in the way we invest in our infrastructure. I want to say something that neither of these two will be able to say. Uh, <laughs> Josh started by saying there's only so much money. Fundamentally, we choose the budgets of our transportation organization through our choices about taxation. We are choosing to underfund our transportation infrastructure. It's not that we couldn't make another choice, as we were just chatting about in New York, right? Not putting in a congestion charge means there's going to be much, you know, billions of dollars less money for transportation, and that was a political choice. We absolutely could do more of these priorities if we chose to care about them in real ways, not just with words, but also with money. Well, I think I can say, behind that. yeah, I think I can say what you just said, because our um, you can call for higher taxes, because we just we, we have taxed ourselves in the last 30 years, four times. Uh, it's and those four are Proposition A uh, for for rail system expand for for rebuilding a rail system in Los Angeles. Proposition C uh, to do more of that. Uh, measure R to build, um, you know, uh, infrastructure, transportation projects, uh, transit in particular, uh, for 40 years. And when we realized that, oh, 40 years, that might not be enough, we went back to the taxpayers and we, eight years later and we said, what do you guys think of a tax on yourself forever for transportation? In 2016, they said yes. So it's it, going back to the question. It's um, I, I think it's it's more of like uh, what what is the political right? Um, what is how 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 far can that community go in terms of allowing itself? And and please don't get me wrong with this this, this statement allowing themselves to fall victim to the circumstance and, and not do the right thing. In that particular case, back in 2016, tax ourselves forever for transportation, in addition to those already uh, that, were, that we uh, uh, allowed, us, allowed us to do. Now, the flip side of that really is, you know, um, where do these dollars go in a 4,800 square mile region like Los Angeles. And that's really the test of, you know, uh, of the prioritization there, right? And again, going back to the question. 
because this last tax measure is not only for infrastructure projects, but we also have you know, funding for service, uh, funding for state of good repair, you know, uh, funding for operations, you know, all of these different things that, you know, the earlier measures were not necessarily, you know, going to fund. So uh, w when I say in terms of like where the prioritization is, you know, um, which regions or which projects now are, are more, uh, are, are going uh, to the top, you know, uh, which area of Los Angeles would need this transportation uh, system more, you know, our East Gateway line, for example, you know, uh, uh, is going to uh, be the next one in uh, in this uh, in this set of projects. It's going to bring people from, you know, uh, from the uh, southeast area of Los Angeles into downtown, going in through communities that have had only buses, you know, uh, for the most part in their whole lifetime, you know, going into different parts of the city. And now we're going to bring that, you know, that system to them. And then that's the other part of this conversation as well, um, you know, uh, on, on the prioritization. You know, uh, I, I did mention earlier about, you know, up to 40% of our infrastructure projects are, you know, going to be prioritized into equity-focused communities, you know, uh, and um, that helps in terms of allowing you know, for, for, for mobility of the region. Uh, the other part of that, and, and, and I'll stop um, uh, at this, uh, the other part of that is, you know, going back to climate change, you know, uh, Josh um, mentioned about the National Climate Assessment, you know, uh, and um, while it's not policy prescriptive, it's policy relevant, you know. Um, so there are four parts of that. If you haven't read the National Climate Assessment, Transportation Chapter, Chapter 13, uh, please read read that uh, after this meeting, uh, after this session. Won't regret it. You won't so regret it. Uh, you <laughs> promise. <laughs> it, 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 it's not a it's not a doozy. Um, so essentially, uh, we 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 said four things. Might be obvious, but you know, uh, for policymakers, uh, for consideration. The first message is, you know, um, transportation uh, act has cost a significant amount of of issues in terms of our climate, nothing new, but you know, the risks are getting minimized and diminished because of the actions that we've done in the last many years, you know, in the last four years at least. The second message there, which is very critical, transportation as we know it is changing. And because transportation as we know it is changing, you know, there is now a call uh, as part of that document to actually look at education, to actually look at how we build, you know, infrastructure, uh, to look at the tools, and we offer tools in there uh, that uh, you won't regret if you, you know, uh, look at those tools to help out in the planning, design, construction. And the fourth one is, you know, um, that, um, you know, because of all these changes in, in, uh, in, uh, in transportation, the way that we are thinking about planning, constructing, operating, and maintaining transportation, should also change, and, and the document offers that. The third key message are there are other cool benefits of transportation that folks may not necessarily think about, and we offer that there as well. And then, and then the fourth one, which no one necessarily wants to talk about, but we consciously, as the authors, uh, thought about it, we offer that, think of the unintended consequences. Think of the unintended consequences of the technologies, of the ideas, of the strategies that we're thinking related to transportation that will help us with climate, but have unintended consequences in other parts of the economy. So I offer those uh, in the interest of time, um, you know, uh, and also as a, bit, as a plug, you know, please read through that. And uh, I encourage you to go back to your cities, go back to your your towns, uh, to your communities, and talk about it with your policymakers and help them better understand what this really means in terms of transportation. We all have a homework assignment. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, Wish you went to let the me just follow session. up on a little piece of that, if I could, Josh, with you. And that is, um, you were the one who initially raised equity in our discussions. I wanted to ask how, 
how do, can policies and planning provide uh, equitable protection from environmental hazards uh, in addition to having equitable access to transportation benefit? Yeah, first I'll say, Chris, just to jab you a little bit, I'm sure your politicians didn't sell that proposition as we are going to tax you forever. You said that with such finality. Um, but it's obviously having that sustainable funding source underpinning your important work is, is key. And quite frankly, I'm envious, as you know. Uh, when we get to equity, sure, it, it, uh, just to, to clarify something about our organization, we are not the kind of instrumentality of government that makes policies or plans that govern others. We are not a regional planning organization. We are not the city of New York, the state of New York or New Jersey, but um, rather a unit of government that overlays specifically to operate critical transportation infrastructure for the region. That being said, of course, we have our own policies and plans and equity is a huge facet of those plans. And we have prioritized particularly under our current um, administration, have prioritized inclusion of equity in the way we uh, invest in assets, the way we make operational decisions. And in the context of uh, resilience, I think equity, I think as, as you alluded to, Chris, equity is part of the conversation both for the environmental hazards that are unfortunately um, an externality of the operations of some of our facilities, particularly port facilities. And that's something that we're working very hard on rectifying uh, with our host communities and with our operating partners at those facilities. But there's also equity and resilience. Um, and what we have prioritized particularly is our path system, our, our public transit system, because it is the backbone of so many communities that have traditionally been underserved. And it is the only means, uh, only practical means of regular transportation for those communities. So we have made over $1.6 billion in resilience oriented investments in that path system uh, since Hurricane Sandy. And some of it, of course, was focused on just cleaning things up and getting the lights back on. A lot of it's focused on ensuring that that system will be there when people need it, uh, that it is a critical lifeline for the um, overburdened communities of Newark and certain patches of Jersey City and other municipalities that we serve. Uh, one of the ways in which we've done that beyond just making very significant investments in resilience is focusing on resilience investments that are, um, that are, are, are operationally unburdensome. Uh, so those that can be deployed relatively rapidly allow us to keep the system in service as long as possible uh, allow us to shut it down only at the last minute, put those protection systems in place, and then hopefully after we've withstood the event, get service rolling again as soon as possible so we can continue to serve those communities. I expect that my co-panelists probably have some perspective on this issue as well. Something to keep in mind about equity right now, when we're talking about transportation, is the ultimate luxury right now is being able to walk where you need to go, right? So if you can walk from your home to your grocery store, to your kid's school, to the place where you work, you are probably living in a very privileged, um, very expensive community because we, we have very little of that. And so, um, you know, supply and demand, it, get, it gets bit up. It tends to be only in historic downtowns that are safe where people can live that way. So that, that's the, you know, if you're really rich, you probably have really good public transit access and you don't need to use it because you, you can walk everywhere. It's also really resilient, right? So in, while I was here, we had a huge storm um, where I'm from in Toronto and uh, underpasses were washed out. The subway was washed out. You know, there's waterfalls coming down into our Union Station. And it's a pretty shocking image, except for the fact that we've seen it before. You know, it happened a few years ago, it happened a few years before that. But people who could walk where they were going just got wet. If you had to drive or take public transit, uh, you, I mean, you were potentially in life-threatening situations. There was the firefighters rescuing people out of underpasses. Um, people with cars were no better off. Um, underground garages became very, very dangerous places. But if you were walking, you were just, it was, it was wet. You know, your shoes got wet and you were fine. 
Uh, and we need to talk about this. And it means that we expand beyond classic conversations of, of public transit. You both said you have real estate portfolios. But to saying, well, what does it mean to build a resilient community? It's one where you don't have to go that far that often. Um, the best version of mobility is one you almost never need because you can just get all the places you need to go. Uh, this is not a very North American way of, of approaching transportation planning, but it is one that we are increasingly having people talk about. I think five or six years ago, I was talking to someone in government and transportation, and I said, you, ever, you know, you ever talk to the planners? And they're like, well, we're having our first meeting. Um, where they were really excited about their first meeting. And this is something we need to do a lot more of. I mean, we started by talking about systems of systems, very dependent on the electricity system, but the transportation system is wholly dependent on the land use system for, for money, for function, for what works and how people choose to move. And for things to be equitable, it becomes even doubly important so that more people can live in these very privileged environments. We don't actually need that much mobility. So, just something to add, thanks, thanks Josh and Sean about, about that. Just something to add, um, because um, there's also an international flavor in the summit, you know, so uh, just add on to a couple of things uh, relative to not only the global south, but, you know, some of the um, you know, overburdened communities in Los Angeles as well, because I see some parallelisms in there on, on what, what I'm seeing. Um, so I'll give you one example. Uh, we uh, usually have visitors from uh, different countries and um, uh, quite a few things uh, on the last visit. Uh, was, we're privileged enough to be visited by the um, uh, Philippine Department of Transportation uh, officials uh, a few weeks ago, and they had uh, the Public-Private Partnership Center uh, from there. Uh, so a few things um, uh, from, from that visit, and then I'll also relate that to Los Angeles, and this is relative to equity. So um, uh, from that visit, you know, uh, they essentially uh, describe, you know, the infrastructure system that they're, they're building, and, and me being part of, be, being from that part of the world, you know, you literally get out of your house, and then from the moment you step down, in, step out into the road, to the point wherein you're about to enter where you're going, there's a mode of transportation that you can actually ride. There's the pedicab, the tricycle, the bus, or the jeepney. There's the rail, and then you repeat that again until you get to the other side. And that's generally true in, uh, in some parts of the world that I've seen. Uh, but compare that to Los Angeles, right? In Los Angeles, you know, in terms of equity and transportation, you know, uh, our, our bus is coming at a certain schedule. You know, uh, many of our bus stops don't necess necessarily have bus shelters and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, benches. You know, and, and I ride the system pretty much regularly, almost every day, uh, and every single time I go to, uh, to the office. And I am pounded by that rain that you're describing or that sun that, that you know, people experience. And I know how that feels in terms of a transit dependent customer. I have a choice, but I chose to ride that bus or that train to experience what that transit dependent uh, um, a stakeholder is experiencing for me to do a better job, to better plan for my system. Uh, the, <clears throat> the other part of that is, you know, uh, where do you actually build this, right? Um, and the reason why I always go back, and unlike New York, Port Authority, MTA, and some other uh, cities, you know, in many parts of the country, uh, in many parts of the world, you know, uh, it, it, the, the transport in the transit system is not necessarily as accessible, right? I have to walk, you know, up to 10 minutes to a bus stop. Uh, and unlike Philippines, which is a developing nation, I have to walk under that sign. So, you know, um, uh, is is the is the equity for for is I have a choice, but a lot of people may not necessarily have a choice. Now, how do I actually now bring you know that inequity closer to to one another? Um, and then the, the last thing I just want to mention uh, in there, in, in terms of walking, you know, uh, we uh, visited Peru, for example, uh, you know, about uh, three weeks ago. And uh, many years ago, uh, the children over there were, were not necessarily going to school. 
in the village that we visited, those, those children were walking two and a half hours one way, one way to go to school. And I'm, I'm mentioning that, that because, you know, us here in the United States, we plan for communities, we work with other uh, governments, and we bring our first world thinking to solve problems in other nations, in other communities. And um, I think what's missing is that, you know, going back to my bus stop example earlier, is that putting ourselves in those people's shoes, literally in their shoes, and better understanding what they're going through, talking at their language, meeting them at where they are, and then co-developing a solution with them versus coming up with a solution on how we know and plan and build and construct in a first world nation like ours. Thank you. Um, I wanna leave time for audience questions. And so let's turn to that. Uh, uh, for those in the room, uh, there, are audio, there are microphones set up on the aisles and you can uh, just queue up on the, on the microphones. Uh, when you uh, come up and to ask questions, please state your name and concisely ask your question so uh, we can get in as many as possible. And for those online, uh, uh, please add questions to the Slido queue uh, so we can incorporate them. Maybe we could uh, start with a online question if, if you have some queued up. We do. Our first online question is, do future plans for transition to sustainable travel factor in rewards like HOV lanes or penalties like higher tolls to incentivize lifestyle changes. Okay. HOV carpool lanes. Got it. I heard agent leanings. <laughs> Who wants to take it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I can tell you. We we have those strategies that we we're looking at. Uh, you know, um, this is a wrong word, and our innovation office will kill me for for saying this on the record. You know, congestion pricing is the idea. Uh, we're looking at, at those ideas right now. Uh, and then we also have, um, uh, look, we're looking at reward, our rewards program uh, for taking more of transit. Uh, you know, um, that was also part of um, uh, some conversations a few years ago. And then the other part of that uh, as well is, um, again, thinking about the transit dependent population, you know, uh, we now offer free, uh, you know, uh, transit and transport service to uh, pretty much all of the students in Los Angeles, uh, you know, uh, and then, um, you know, we have instituted a life program uh, wherein for those who uh, declare that they cannot afford uh, public transit, you know, uh, that they apply through that life program, they're able to take public transit for free. It's as close to a free transportation system that we can offer, you know, uh, the, the people of Los Angeles. And for those who can afford, you know, uh, we encourage them to, um, you know, choose transit. Um, you know, uh, I'll just be candid, um, uh, not, not a secret. Um, most of the transportation systems, transit systems across the nation have had safety issues. Uh, we're addressing those right now. Uh, our, our board had um, uh, also um, authorized us to bring back, you know, uh, our uh, unlike the Port Authority, we were in the next five years, we'll have our, uh, you know, we'll bring back our, our police, uh, our transit police back uh, in, into the system, uh, you know, who better understand, you know, how our riders ride and how our system actually operates. So, We also um, have had increased presence of security in our transit system in Toronto where I live, but I also want to point out that car transportation is the most dangerous place to get around. We, we talk about public transit as dangerous, statistically much more dangerous to get into a car. Um, for us, the answer to that question is public transportation is always about sticks. Um, and there's a great quote, which is, uh, I'm going to butcher, but basically, you know, in the morning, you don't make the sustainability choice, you make the convenient, affordable choice. And so you need public transportation and active transportation to be the easiest, cheapest, fastest way to get where people are going. Um, and so it's all about 
sticks and carrots. Uh, rather than HOV lanes, the big thing that's on the books in, in my world is uh, dedicated bus lanes, so you know, cheap BRT. And as I said before, you can build them really fast. They can deliver higher order transit really quickly to a lot of people. And uh, in Toronto, we've been talking for about a decade about making five high capacity bus routes, uh, dedicated bus lanes. And at the moment, it's supposed to happen in the late 2020s, but who knows? Uh, it's one of those things where we just need political leadership and it could be done in a few years. And if we continue to have political fear, it'll stay on the books. I'll say a little anecdote. So my partner is deathly afraid of flying. She had to fly to a conference recently and she said, um, reassure me as somebody who works in the airport industry or, or has airport facilities. And I said, oh yeah, you're much more likely to die in the cab than you are on the plane. <laughs> True story. Anyway, sorry to darken the mood in the room. Uh, but I totally agree with the argument that uh, consumers are often making choices based on cost and convenience. And if that happens to be the most sustainable choice, all the better. Um, a great example for Port Authority is the XBL, the express bus lane for the Lincoln Tunnel. And those are commuters who are generally middle income commuters uh, coming in from New Jersey um, and then leaving from Port Authority bus terminal. Uh, but they have a more, if you take the bus through Lincoln Tunnel uh, during the peak periods, you're much more likely to arrive at your destination on time. There's a strong argument behind convenience and cost. Um, and, and yes, like we don't control the roadway network, for example. We don't, we don't have a bus system that operates outside of our facilities. So in terms of HOV lanes and the like, it's not a choice, unfortunately, that we can make unilaterally. Uh, but we have prioritized, for example, uh, EV charging at our airport parking. And I recognize that there is, are some contradictions there because flying itself is not the most um, environmentally sustainable mode, although we're working on that as well. But we are helping customers, if they choose to drive into those airports, make a somewhat more sustainable choice by providing them with uh, preferential places to park um, and very easy, fast uh, charging infrastructure. So every little bit uh, counts. Let's, let's turn to the audience over here. Hi, I'm Michael Replogel, a former deputy commissioner for policy for New York City Department of Transportation, now a consultant. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure law provided hundreds of billions of dollars for investment in transportation infrastructure. The Biden administration's doing a great job putting the discretionary part of that into justice and climate solution uh, initiatives something like 80% of that uh, five or six hundred billion dollars is flexible formula money going to the states and recent research by RMI and others shows that a lot of states are putting a disproportionate share of that flexible money into expanding roads rather than shifting the incentives to pay people to carpool or to invest in better buses or bikeways um, how can we change that uh, framework? How can we bring more transparency and accountability to states over how they're spending this money? Vote early, vote often. Um, I mean, a lot of this is very built-in culture. Um, really one of the United States' leading innovations and in exports about how to move around in space. Right? This is very, very American that when we think about transportation, what we mean is roads and cars. Um, getting people to move away from that is going to be hard and it's going to involve talking about it. I mean, I would say one thing is you just have to talk to people about it and try to use as much language as you can of the things they value. Often that's cost yep. um, and convenience. There's a small number of people who will be moved by sustainability and equity, but mostly it's just cost and convenience. Roads and highways are very expensive. They're very expensive to maintain. They're a very inefficient way of moving people. Uh, there's a huge amount of information and data on all of these things. Uh, I would use that as much as you can, but you know, just sort of embrace that you're fighting an uphill battle. Change will be slow for a long time, and then hopefully eventually all at once. And that's really what I was referring to earlier. You know, um, each one of you here in this room, you know, you have a role to play. You know, if you don't speak up on your 
preferences, uh, you know, speak up to your policymakers on, on you know, um, where you know those projects could be and what those projects are. Then it's not going to be right. Uh, I agree with Shashana in, in terms of like, and I, we have to be honest with ourselves. You know, um, if if I want to go uh, to the grocery, and I'll give you my personal experience. If I want to go to the grocery, and if I drive, right. It takes me five minutes. If I want to wait for the bus, you know, now I have to wait for the bus to come to the bus stop, go to the grocery, and wait for another however long the next schedule for the bus is going back. You know, so it's not necessarily the most cost efficient way and cost effective way of using my personal time, but I have a choice, right? Uh, um, that, that's, that's, the, that's one part of it. And, but and, and, and that's you know probably why a lot of the policymakers who don't hear from us on on what our preferences are 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 putting in and advocating for for those infrastructures to be built. It's sort of like you know uh, ironic, right? But um, but at the same time, you know uh, on on the customer side of it, you know uh, um, are we using more of the transportation system? Sorry, of the transit system uh, versus the road network. Um, I don't know with your cities, but you know, for us, uh, except for a few lines, our, our buses are almost always not, you know, uh, not full. Uh, and um, our fare box collection is low to begin with, um, but we're offering it. We're, we're, we're creating a new generation of transit riders by offering transit for free for all of our school children. And in a generation, you know, uh, all of us who are not talking about transit, uh, that generation will be so used to it. I could point to my son, for example, so used to transit, you know, and, and he, he doesn't like driving. He prefers to ride the bus and, uh, and that's convenient for him versus other people, other kids who are used to being driven around and not growing up uh, in, that, in that system uh, and then forcing them to actually ride that bus in the future. Well, he lives in a great region for that. Yeah, exactly. Um, hi, Michael. I remember you from your days at City DOT. Uh, I don't know how to, you know, from a from the standpoint of states leveraging formula funds and spending them on, let's say, objectively less sustainable outcomes. I, I don't know how to solve that problem, but I share your lament because Port Authority, as you're probably aware, is only eligible for the discretionary pots, so we get what's left over, and we have to compete for it. And we have to compete on merits. So it does frustrate me um, because if states are going to be using formula funds to invest in more traditional, uh, more polluting, more carbon intensive systems, then I, I guess what I would say is the shameless pitch, put more in the discretionary uh, <laughs> where we have to compete, uh, where we have to show pretty empirically the merits of our proposals and how they meet the environmental objectives of the administration. Okay, thank you. Maybe we'll take one more question from the audience. Hi, I'm Dr. Reed Omri. I'm the previous chair of radiology at Vanderbilt. So I live in Nashville, Tennessee. And Shoshana, you said something that really hit me, which is I'm incredibly privileged to be able to bike to work. What do I say to the many millions of Tennesseans who live in rural Tennessee when we talk about issues like transportation, that they don't have a way to walk anywhere, they can't bike anywhere, there's no public transportation, and a lot of what they're doing in their jobs involves pickup trucks. These aren't uh, these aren't suburbanites in their pickup truck. These, these, so I, I I ask genuinely to 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 understand what I can do to try to advocate for more of a transportation sustainability mindset in Tennessee. But I don't know what to say to somebody as soon as they say, "Hey, you're just some." Um, Nashvilleian, and you don't understand us? I think it's a really fair question. You're gonna to have to forgive me, my Tennessee geography is not good. So could you tell me what proportion of people in Tennessee live in cities and suburbs versus rurally? 
uh, let's just say roughly half of the people are rural. All right. So for the half of people who are rural who are really using their pickup trucks to truck things, then on the scale of the next 10, 15 years, what we're talking about is reasonable trucks. Right? Have you seen the pictures of modern trucks and like 1980s trucks? Uh, what we need for sustainable transportation in places where you really do need trucks is to wind back the clock on trucks. There is no reason that trucks need to be so inflated, so dangerous, so heavy, so expensive, so polluting in their movements. They haul just as much stuff, right? Real men were men in the 80s too with their smaller trucks, right? So that's what we're talking about in the rural, um, in the rural areas. <laughs> The average pickup truck hauls less than once a year, right? So most people who are driving pickup trucks are doing it mm -hmm. as jewelry. Um, so we can put that aside. Then there's the other 50% of people who do live in places where there's stuff nearby. Uh, and for that, a lot of the time what we need is a reallocation of infrastructure. There should be way more bike lanes. Uh, the classic line about bike lanes is you can't tell you need a bridge by people swimming across the river. So everyone's like, well, no one bikes. Why should we build a bike lane? Of course nobody bikes. People don't like to think they're going to die when they leave their house. So in the places where there's reasonable amounts of people and absolutely can work in suburbs, we need good bike lanes. Um, dedicated bus lanes will do it as well. I mean, part of the reason the buses sometimes are empty is because buses can be really slow. Buses are kind of a shitty way to move around unless they're in a dedicated lane. So we should have buses and dedicated lanes on big arterials. And we should have a, a lot of bike lanes. And also, you know, tell all your friends, you should just need rat, um, wax poetic about the joys of e-bikes because they're good. And once you use one, you become an evangelist. And so, you know, invite your friends for rides, let them try out your bicycle. Um, you know, you can go do fun things together. It just becomes a super fun way to move around. Um, and it doesn't have to be about saving the world. It can just be because you want it to be more fun and cheaper and faster. And just to follow up on that one, uh, that's really what I was saying earlier, you know, in terms of, you know, if you, if you want to, like, you know, work with uh, the folks, that, you know, in, in rural Tennessee, I mean, it's, it's essentially hearing from them directly, like, how, how could this be... How could this work for you, right? Um, in terms of uh, these strategies that Shoshana had uh, had mentioned, um, because you know, part part of the challenge I think is, you know, again, uh, we we live in places where a lot of the ideas that we develop are applicable where we live, but since we don't have the same lived experiences as those folks in the rural areas, then we might be offering them things that's not necessarily, you know, practical for them. I'll just put it that way. You know, um, uh, uh, not not nothing about active transportation. You know, uh, I uh, in in one of the more affluent cities in in Los Angeles area, who I will not mention. You know, um, they have a very aging population. You know, and a lot of folks are advocating for more active more active transportation system in that city. You said it started with 70 year olds. Um, but anyway, but the, the point I'm trying to make there is that, you know, um, uh, absent e-bikes, you know, uh, folks, uh, the aging population in that city who I've talked to are not naturally a big fan of, you know, active transportation networks. Bicycles. Simply, simply because of where they are and the hilly nature of their affluent community. I'll just put it that way. So. New bike tricycles. <laughs> I'm, I'm not joking. Yeah. Exactly. Definitely. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, when, when you have a two lane highway uh, in an affluent community. No, I'm, I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, let's turn to a question from uh, the virtual world, if we could. Can you, is there another question? There is. Um, so this question um, is about um, preparing for the most extreme effects of climate change. So um, when preparing transportation systems to be resilient to climate change, what level of warming is planned for? 
Um, I know at the job where I'm working, we don't yet have an actual level of warming we're planning for. It's just planned for an increase. Um, and relatedly, you know, what sort of planning do you undertake for extreme situations such as sequential relocation due to sea level rise? I missed a couple of elements of that question. Would you mind repeating it? Yes. So um, what level of warming do you plan for um, if your uh, place of work has that? Um, and how do you plan for particularly disruptive situations such as something like sequential relocation? I'll answer that question this way. So uh, there's a concept called functional resiliency uh, that's very popular with um, uh, structural engineers uh, and you know the, 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 the state of science on, on climate um, uh, is um, uh, I mean while a lot of people are saying oh you know there's a certain limit that we need to plan for um, the models are the models uh, and um, uh, we, we need to at least be aware of what those limits are in terms of our infrastructure. So uh, functional resiliency is one of them, uh, one of the ideas we're in. You, know, you actually build uh, so that whenever uh, there is a significant stressor that impacts that infrastructure, uh, you could easily get back you know, into um, whatever that operation is. So it's for a bridge, there is a minimal uh, operating capacity for that bridge so that while you're still building it, you know, after a significant disruptor, then the whole region can still function while you're building it. And that happened in Los Angeles, for example, we had this, this big fire in, in the center of, of, of uh, city center, wherein, you know, the original projection was, um, you know, uh, uh, up to six months uh, of disruption. Uh, but um, for whatever reason, that bridge is functionally resilient. And within three days, we're able to bring it back to service while they're still rebuilding it to its original form. The other part I just want to mention uh, um, in, in, uh, in answering that question is that, you know, um, I go back to what I was saying earlier in terms of the standards, right? Um, it, it's one thing to say we're planning for and then building according to what we plan for versus what the standards are actually requiring me, the engineer, to design and build, you know. Um, and so in, on, on that second part of that statement, it's what's requiring the engineer to design and build. It's, it's, it's what the standards and how I'm comfortable on the performance of what I'm, of what I'm building is what's going to get built. And if it's above and beyond that, then the owner like myself has to tell and has to require and has to pay for uh, for that infrastructure to become more resilient, to become more sustainable in the future. Um, whether you build that into your, to your tender, to your contract or not, uh, we do, uh, but for other agencies, um, you know, it might be an option. Uh, and again, it's a function of the standard that, you know, the engineer is, is, is building for. So. Let me try and squeeze in one more question uh, because oh, I want to give you there. folks a, a time for a final word at the end of our meeting from the audience. <laughs> Hi, thank you. You've addressed this in a number of ways already, so this might be fast, but uh, how can we climate-proof existing aging infrastructure that's being strained by climate change, such as I think this past week I saw a bridge in Chicago that couldn't close all the way because heat made it expand too much, so it wasn't even usable while simultaneously implementing new climate resilient infrastructure that oftentimes clashes with, as Shoshana mentioned, um, clashes with car centric or car dependent areas and cultural norms. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to piggyback on the last question and you've actually given me a great opportunity to do so. Um, I think uh, the answer I think to both questions is it, the investment needs to be proportionate to the probability adjusted consequence of failure. So as we as an agency, when we as an agency are determining to what standard we build, um, to what standard we integrate resilience into an asset, either that we are repairing or rehabilitating as part of our state of good repair program, we're a 103 year old agency and we have many critical assets, including George Washington Bridge that are rounding the corner toward the century <clears throat> mark. So this is very relevant to us. How do we renew and refurbish 
our infrastructure in a climate resilient way? And how do we also build those critical system enhancing projects that um, require massive new investments, off, oftentimes in the billions of dollars? And the answer, which is you can file under easier said than done, is proportionality to the consequences. That really needs to govern. So if the consequence is people die if this fail, fails, obviously that's a, a really significant consequence and it requires a very significant response. If it is, there is temporary revenue loss, uh, which affects the Port Authority's bottom line, but ultimately there's not a life safety concern, there's not a significant um, regional economic ripple, then that's a different matter where failure for a certain period of time might be acceptable. So our general principle is seek proportionality in the strategies that we integrate. For things like that bridge that didn't close, the way we deal with it is that we embrace a standard operating procedure that sometimes the bridge isn't gonna close. Um, it's very hard, it will be very hard to adjust all of our built world for a climate it never expected. And the worse we let the climate get, the harder it will be. And a lot of, you know, we have lived our whole lives in a world where infrastructure is just background, it works all the time. You know, it's always comfortable and functional and smooth and things are, you know, basically work. That will be less true going forward. It will still be exceptionally true for those of us who live in North America, but it's going to be less true than it was. And that will just be part of how we deal with the world. You know, things will be closed a little bit more on really hot days. You won't be able to go grab that bridge or take off from an airplane in Arizona. And that's just the way we're going to deal with a lot of this stuff. Yeah, or where that bridge is on the Northeast Corridor, and we have an example, you invest $1.9 billion to fix it because that becomes a, not just a regional priority, but a national program priority. Um, otherwise, if it's, I mean, I'll tell you what the operational strategy for years before that investment was put in place or is on track to be put in place, it's send out crews with pumper trucks and just hose down the pieces and parts of the movable bridge to ensure that they don't um, overexpand. Uh, and so that you can maintain some degree of reliability. That's not a very elegant or sexy solution, but it's sure a practical one. But I don't, I, I'm not contradicting your point at all. There is some infrastructure, depending on its function, depending once again on whether it has a life safety implication, what, it's, uh, what the implication of failure on revenues in regional economic or, or national economic situation is. There are some pieces of infrastructure that might just have to fail more frequently. For those that can't, there's no other solution but to invest. Okay, thank you. Um, in the last couple of minutes we've got, I'll let each of you uh, uh, give one takeaway that you'd like the audience to, to leave with. Uh, Susanna, I'll start with you. Uh, I'm gonna give you an optimistic takeaway. We have a massive number of tools available to us to build a sustainable, resilient infrastructure future, transportation future. We know how to do this from a technical standpoint. Uh, it is no longer technically not understood. We don't, you know, we're not relying on any Hail Mary widgets to be invented in a research lab somewhere. We've got this technically, we can do it. We just have to be willing to do it. Chris? Yeah, it's... Uh... It's in our hands, you know. Uh, we were the last day and a half that you know I've immersed myself uh, in in the summit. Uh, I've heard and, and talked to a lot of people uh, from different parts of the world. Uh, uh, I uh, commiserate with them in, in their challenges, but you know, un unless we leave here today and you know talk to and uh, work with uh, our our communities. On, on what we know, then this is just a successful summit uh, uh, and, and nothing more, you know. Uh, and then one last point uh, related to that, uh, I was talking to uh, one of the NASM officers last night uh, and um, uh, she was asking me like, what could NASM do better? And I said, well, you know, uh, maybe, you know, uh, not just uh, be uh, the convener, uh, but actually be uh, the pusher of action uh, for, for these, so. With 40 seconds left, I'll say the greatest thing is just to get started, is not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. 
uh, Gina McCarthy sat in this chair two hours ago and said something to the effect of, we just need to go like hell. And who better to say it? So I take that seriously. The, the best thing is not to seek necessarily, to seek per perfection perhaps, but not rely on perfection in order to stand up your own programs and move forward aggressively. The greatest thing is just to get out of the gates and go. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to, to thank our panelists for sharing their knowledge and their eloquence.